I will now uh, turn things over to uh, Albert Thompson, our uh, vice chairman of the National Committee, uh, sometimes known as the Iron Professor. And uh, he will uh, introduce our first guest and um, begin our first uh, discussion uh, of the convention on uh, what Christian democracy is all about. Thanks, Albert. All right. Thank you, Patrick, for the introduction. I'd like to take this time to introduce my guest, a former senator of the Republic of Chile, Ignacio Walker. Now, uh, Dr. Walker has served as a Chilean foreign minister uh, from 2004 to 2006, and as a senator from 2010 to 2018. He previously served eight years in the Chamber of Deputies, the lower house of the Chilean Congress, and is a past president of the Christian Democratic Party from 2010 to 2015. Uh, he is currently a senior research fellow and a professor at Pontifica Universidad Catholica uh, de Valparaiso. Uh, he is the author, amazingly, of 10 books, including Democracy in Latin America and Christians Without Christianity, Reflections of a Catholic Legislature. Uh, former Senator Walker, I want to thank you for being with us this evening. Well, thank you very much, uh, Albert, for this uh, presentation. Thank you very much, Patrick, for your invitation to share a conversation uh, at this time. And thank you, Drew, for your prayer, uh, which is also very uh, stimulating to start our reflections of, of today. Well, I've been a Christian Democrat throughout my life. So I would like to share with my friends uh, from the United States of America, uh, a country in which I have lived for four years. I was a, uh, I got my PhD in political science from Princeton University in the mid 80s. And then I was a professor at that university. I have been a fellow at Notre Dame University. So I have lots of stories and friends in the United States. And I'm very happy to, to share some thoughts about what is Christian democracy. You know, at least from our own understanding. I'm talking from Chile, from South America, uh, in a relationship that has been closer to Europe, perhaps, in terms of uh, a political uh, philosophy. So let me just share a few minutes, 10 or 15 minutes I've been allowed, uh, in order to have some uh, conversation and question and answer perhaps uh, afterwards. Well, I would say that uh, Christian democracy is an idea, a political movement, and a political party, for in that orders, order it appears historically, an idea that became a political movement, uh, then a political party, uh, that brings together the Christian tradition of thought with the democratic tradition. No? Both had been thought for most of the time, especially since the French Revolution, as somehow opposed to each other, no? the Christian tradition, the democratic tradition. No? or seen in terms of the tensions and some kinds of contradictions between a Christian and a democratic uh, understanding. Well, uh, I would say that Christian democracy uh, is the coming together of the Christian tradition of thought with the modern, secular, and democratic world. And I want to underscore the modern, secular, and democratic world aimed at producing a dialogue, an encounter, no, between those uh, two traditions. A modern, secular, and democratic world that somehow had been seen like anathema by the Catholic Church, no, which adopted a kind of defensive stance, especially starting in the French Revolution uh, and the 19th uh, century. Well, such was the great contribution, bringing together the Christian tradition and the democratic tradition. Such was the great contribution, I would say, of the so-called Christian philosophers of democracy, especially the French political philosoph philosophers like Jacques Maritain, Emmanuel Mounier, and others, particularly in the period between the two wars, you know, the Great War and World War II, in the face of the rise of totalitarianism, you know, Nazism, fascism, Stalinism or communism, uh, broadly speaking, within the context in the 30s, no, of the crisis of liberal democracy, as the Weimar Republic or, or the problems in the French Republic, the crisis of liberal democracy and liberal capitalism, no, as the crash of 1929 and so on. So that was the context in which these Christian philosophers of democracy uh, aimed at bringing together these two traditions, no, the Christian tradition with the democratic tradition. 
Well, one of the key doctrinal bodies behind that powerful idea that was a kind of intellectual revolution, no, uh, one of those doctrinal bodies was the social teachings of the Catholic Church, no, that marked, in turn, for example, in Chile, the passing from the youth of the conservative party to the Christian Democratic Party. No? In our case, we wanted to take seriously in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s, the social doctrine of the church, especially Rerum Novarum, which is an encyclica of 1891 around the social question. No? And Quadragesimo An, 40 years after in 1931, in the middle of the crisis, of liberal capitalism or liberal democracy and the uh, rise of uh, totalitarianism, no? uh, which somehow proposed a kind of third way no? between liberal capitalism and Marxist socialism no? uh, around a certain idea of social justice no? and around the social question, which was referred to the emergence or the rise of the proletariat or the working classes, you no, know, while trying to avoid the class struggle that was preached by the Marxist uh, criticism or liberal capitalism. Well, in Europe, in Germany, in Italy, in Belgium, in the Netherlands, and so on, Christian democracy usually took the form of a compromise, a kind of compromise between Catholicism and Protestantism, you no, know, and between labor and business. No, that was the kind of compromise of the Christian democratic movement uh, in Europe. Well, I want to emphasize, of course, that Christian democracy uh, is not a religious movement. It is not a religious movement. No, it is a political movement, a secular, lay, non-confessional political movement or political party. No, that is very important uh, to understand. So it was Robert Schumann in France Alcides de Gasperi in Italy, Konrad Adenauer you know, in Germany following World War II, that were some of the leading figures of European Christian democracy, you know, where it developed in the middle of the Cold War, in the post-war period, around what we should call the European project you know, that led in the end to the European Union and all that we know. That was the case in Europe, and it still is today. You know? Well, in Latin America, in our region, no, the Western Hemisphere, it was Eduardo Frey, president of Chile in the 60s, Rafael Caldera in Venezuela, and other leading social Christian or Christian democratic leaders that advocated structural reforms. In that time, it was agrarian reform, peasant unionization, uh, and others, you know, uh, in terms of modernization of our structures, which was sometimes seen, especially from different administrations in the United States as leftism or even communism, but it was not the case. In fact, it was an alternative to a Marxist understanding of socialism. Well, I have always wondered, by the way, why a Christian democratic political movement never emerged in the United States. Perhaps, perhaps, I leave it to our discussion. Uh, one hypothesis no, is that uh, religion no, which is seen in the United States, as far as I understand, as a private matter, no? uh, and the Christian democratic political movement, uh, perhaps uh, there, there was a kind of contradiction in those two uh, terms. No? So there was no space in the political realm to something like a Christian democratic political movement. But I leave it for the discussion. You have to tell me about it. So Jacques Maritain, this French political philosopher in the 1940s, published two very important books, Christianity and Democracy, 1943. So the idea of bringing together the Christian democratic, uh, the Christian tradition and the democratic tradition and the man and the state in 1949. In fact, very much influenced, of course, by Europe, but by his stay in the United States. He lived in Princeton uh, for some years and uh, the experience of living liberal democracy in the United States was important for Jacques Maritain. He was behind the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, uh, for example. So in the 1930s and 1940s, uh, there was a kind of split of tension, uh, of struggles, intellectual struggles, between a pluralistic view of Catholicism, 
around human rights and democracy, and an integralist view of Catholicism, rather conservative. There was this kind of clash. You know? Christian democracy emerged from the first view of a pluralistic understanding uh, of Catholicism. So the dignity of the human person, the universal value of human rights, are some of the cornerstones of this political philosophy, which was very much endorsed in the Second Vatican Council of the Catholic Church in the early 1960s, which was very important in adopting this kind of opening to the modern secular and democratic world, this aggiornamento, no, this dialogue. Well, so religious freedom was adopted very importantly, uh, Dignitatis Humanae, a very important uh, document in 1965. The dignity of the moral conscience, very much important. The just autonomy of the political community. The role of the lay person within the realm of politics, no? beyond any clerical understanding. And later on, the role of ethical discernment, for example were some of the key components of the Vatican Council. I referred to these ideas in my recent book, Christ Christians Without Christendom, which was published uh, last year in the experience in my case as a Catholic or Christian democratic uh, legislator. So the Second Vatican Council uh, was very much, uh, very much important in this, uh, in this respect. Now, there has always been, in terms of us who consider ourselves Catholics and Christian Democrats, a kind of tension between the hierarchy of the Catholic Church and the role of the lay person. You know? In fact, I was looking, uh, Albert, these days at this uh, 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 discussion in the United States around the National Conference of Bishops, you know? on the question of the Eucharist and communion and, and the, the Catholic politicians that endorsed pro-choice and so on. So there has always been a tension. This is not new and it doesn't belong only to the United States. It's quite a uh, widespread. So it's not easy to be a Christian politician or lay person you know, uh, within this realm of religious freedom, of the just autonomy of the political community, etc. Well, in Chile, that was also the case uh, in terms of legislation in different matters. Uh, now, in our uh, case, there has been a convergence especially in our recent history, the last 30 years, between a Christian democratic and a social democratic understanding, no? especially from the view of Latin America, developing countries, no? in the face of socioeconomic inequalities, no? which has been at the core of our shared commitments to the question of social justice. No? So we Christian Democrats and we social Democrats have come together in many ways around the kind of progressive uh, understanding, although we have been questioned and criticized by the far left, the communist, the populist left, which have referred to us as neoliberals, you know, which we are not. But of course, we believe in an open market economy with a thriving private sector uh, and so on, but along a kind of social democratic or Christian democratic uh, understanding committed to social justice. You know? uh, and we have been critical of both neoliberal approaches and neo-populist approaches, whether from the right or from the left. Well, Angela Merkel uh, in Germany, uh, who has advocated the Grand Coalition, this is the third Grand Coalition, no, between Christian democracy and social democracy, so it's not so original in our case. Uh, Brazil, under Fernando Enrique Cardoso and the Social Democratic Party, are some of the examples in the international arena of, of this coming together of Christian democracy and social democracy in our case, no? in Latin America, in Europe. Now, the big question to finish with, in order to have some conversation, uh, the big question on the future of Christian democracy, now in a post-Cold War, post-authoritarian world, the third wave of democratization, as Samuel Huntington refers to it, even a post-revolutionary world, no? uh, is how to face and with this, I uh, finish uh, as a way of a provocation for our conversation, how to face the greatest threat on democracy, in my opinion, in our opinion, today in the world, which is the nationalist populist wave, whether from the right or from the left, no? that question 
the institutions of representative democracy, of liberal democracy. So how to adopt the defense of human rights, the defense of democracy, no? the defense of social justice, no? that are the, the basic pillars of a true, of a true Christian uh, democratic uh, understanding. So I appreciate very much that life, justice, peace, environment, I took note here of your introduction, are some of the key aspects of the American Solidarity Party. And that's a, as a way of an introduction, uh, uh, Albert. So you if you have any questions or any comments, I would very pleased to share uh, in common uh, some thoughts about this Christian democratic uh, political movement, especially in Europe and Latin America. Nacio, I think I speak for everyone in saying thank you for a very stimulating and thought provoking discussion about Christian democracy, its history, its roots and your experience in it. I'd like to go straight to what you just brought up, the, the threats to our modern democratic order, because it appears that historically, when there have been threats and catastrophes, and when people have been through particular terrible or controversial regimes that have divided or oppressed people, you've seen Christian democracy in Italy, in Germany, to an extent under de Gaulle after Vichy France, emerge as a, a solution or antidote, something that helps to stabilize the country and the people. And I'd like to talk about Chile, because it was after the referendum of 1988 that you had a regime transition. And the first president after Pinochet was actually a Christian Democrat, Patricio Elwin. And then followed after him was Eduardo Frey the Younger. Uh, not the elder phrase you mentioned before. And I'd like to ask you how did Christian democracy emerge as a, a driving force in democratization in Chile at the end of the Cold War and help to st steer Chile towards democracy after two successful presidencies? Well, in fact, uh, Albert, those two great presidents were Christian Democrats. Uh, we faced a very, very tense, difficult transition after the brutal dictatorship of General Pinochet. I was myself a human rights lawyer at the age of 23. So I could tell you lots of stories about how my generation struggled in favor of human rights and democracy in the face of this very brutal uh, dictatorship of, of General Pinochet. And we advocated in the 1980s, a peaceful transition to democracy, which was like crazy, like utopian thought. I mean, how to advocate a peaceful transition to democracy when you are facing this military reg regime. And on the other hand, the Communist Party that was advocating some kind of a, a military or paramilitary strategy you know, in order to oppose a, a dictatorship. And we managed to do that. We mobilized the Chilean people around the question of human rights. The Catholic Church at that time performed a very, very important role, a prophetic role announcing the kingdom of God and its justice, no? And denouncing everything that opposed uh, that uh, quest, no? And we managed to, to win the 1988 plebiscite, which nobody believed in the United States or Europe that we were going to defeat Pinochet in its own ground. No, he had adopted a constitution that uh, uh, contemplated a plebiscite in order to re-elect Pinochet for eight more years, to remain 25 years in power. Well, the no vote, we managed to register, 92% of the people registered in four months. No? And we managed to win that plebiscite, which allowed for a peaceful transition, then followed a kind of negotiation between the, the military regime no cierto, and the Concertación, the concertación is the coming together of Christian democracy and social democracy. And well, we had 20 years of the concertación for democracy, no? around two uh, Christian democratic presidents, Elwin and Frey, as you were mentioning, and two socialist or social democrats, Lagos and Bachelet. I uh, was foreign minister of President Lagos, and it was uh, at times, those 20 years, of a great poverty reduction. First of all, economic growth. We managed to grow during 25 years at an average of 5% per year. And that allowed to reduce poverty from 40% to 10% in 20 years. And the new middle sector, middle class emerged. Now, all that is being questioned today, Albert, by the more radical left, communist populist left, because it would seem, according to them, that we negotiated, there was too much compromise between the preceding military regime and the democratic administrations. 
So it, that was the case also in Uruguay, in Brazil, in Argentina, uh, in the south of, of uh, Europe, no? remember Spain, Portugal, Greece no? in the 1970s, later on in Southeast Asia, in Taiwan, in South Korea, in, in South Africa. So this third wave of democratization you know, has been at the core of this movement, which in the case of Chile and Brazil and others have had the, a strong leadership of Christian Democrats and Social Democrats. Now, it's very interesting, Ignacio, the way you frame that. There's almost a practicality uh, to what you're discussing because Christian democracy, to those who are unfamiliar with it in the United States, might sound utopian or overly religious, but what you're saying is that there's a sensibility and practicality to it, that you're able to negotiate with a brutal military regime, the return of democracy and avoid this, this leftist dream of protracted people struggle or bloodshed in the streets, and that you got what you wanted through adhering to what were in fact your morals, your beliefs, but in a sensible and practical way to deliver democracy to the people. Could you tell us a bit more about how you as an activist in the 1980s came to the conclusion that that was the way to go? Well, my generation, uh, Albert, first of all, we were opposition to a leftist uh, Marxist government of President Allende, who was democratically elected. So then came the military coup. That was three years and then 17 years of a military dictatorship, right wing military dictatorship. So my generation, Christian Democrats spent 20 years of our lives you know, uh, as opposition, trying to advocate social justice, but through peaceful means, political means, rejecting any form of violence, you know, whether from the left or from the right, uh, uh, advocating a, a democratic rule of law, you know, a representative democracy you know, in the tradition of constitutional, deliberative, representative uh, democracy you know, and increasing levels of participation. So many of us uh, grew up in our youth and other, under the dictatorship within the umbrella of the Catholic Church at that time, you know, uh, under the leadership of Cardinal Raul Silva Enriquez, for example, who created this vicariate of solidarity, where some of us became human rights lawyers, uh, as in my case, and it, he defined the Catholic Church which was like the only opposition to the dictatorship initially, as the voice of the voiceless, you know? the voice of the voiceless. And we managed through the struggle in favor of human rights to advocate and to undertake effectively you know, this peaceful uh, transition uh, to democracy. So uh, everything grew up from an activism, as you say, of thousands of us, well, not very many, let me tell you, during the dictatorship, but this grew up as people realized that a polarized scenario between a Pinochet for 25 years uh, you know, being reelected and the Communist Party advocating violence at the other side, that would have left, led you know, to a very, well, uh, polarizing uh, situation with unforeseen uh, outcomes or results. So, this was the case in South America. Let us recall that in the 70s, in Latin America, there were only three democratic countries, Venezuela, Colombia, and Costa Rica. That was it. All the rest, all the red was military regimes and dictatorships, no? Uh, well, uh, so that was part of our experience. Now, during your time as foreign minister, you actually served under uh, President Laos, who was of the Party for Democracy, so a center-left party. Now, you didn't serve under a Christian Democratic president. And you've talked a lot about this, this conversation, this consultation, this grand coalition. How did you, as a Christian Democrat, uh, serve as a foreign minister? And what were some of the priorities and things that you tried to implement from 2004, 2006? in Chilean foreign policy uh, that you could share with us as examples of how that coalition can work together? Well, basically under the Lagos administration, who is a social democrat, the party of democracy or the socialist party, which is like the social democratic movement in Chile. So President Lagos and President Bachelet, who came afterwards, have been accused by the hard left, no? Uh, the more radical left of, be, of being neoliberals, no? social democrats and Christian democrats, you are neoliberals, no? which we are not. No? Uh, in Chile, I don't know, Albert, but you, perhaps you know that we had the Chicago Boys experience in the 1970s under Pinochet that were true neoliberals, no? the trickle-down economics and so on that led 
to 40% of the population under the poverty line. You know? I work in a think tank, CIEPLAN, uh, which was very critical of that kind of blueprint, you know? a neoliberal understanding of this trickle-down economics under, of course, an authoritarian regime. You know? But also we have been critical of neopopulism. I want to underscore this. Uh, whether from the right, in which we consider President Trump, in United States, President Bolsonaro, in Brazil, many people from Europe, Marine Le Pen in France, uh, Matteo Salvini in Italy, Viktor Orban in Hungary, you know, and many others, you know, Erdogan in Turkey, and so on. But also from the left, like Nicolás Maduro, the dictator of Venezuela today, a corrupt dictatorship. You know? Hugo Chavez and Nicolás Maduro in Venezuela, Daniel Ortega, needless to say, in Nicaragua, another corrupt uh, you know, dictatorship in, in Central America. Well, increasingly so, although under a democratic umbrella, López Obrador in Mexico, who is a kind of leftist nationalist populist. You know? So behind all those kinds of experiences of neo-populism, of this authoritarian nationalist populist wave, look at Modi in India, a, a religious nationalism, no? but which is questioning freedom of expression, independence of the judiciary, and so on and so forth. So our struggle today, Albert, is how to defend democracy. That's our basic task, because it's the political regime of freedom no? that protects human rights no? in, in a better way. So we have to be on guard. No? We have to be aware of these threats to democracy, to liberal democracy, constitutional democracy, rule of law, freedom of expression, independence of the judiciary, accountability in any part of the world. No? And, and that's, I think, is the true uh, challenge that we have uh, ahead. Thank you, Ignacio. I'd like to take a few questions from the audience. So I'm going through here and there is a question from Kevin Maurer. He says, what use have Christian democratic movements made of the word solidarity, solidaridad in popular messaging? Oh, that's definitely a very key component of what we have called growth with equity, no? So it's not growth plus equity, social equity, it's growth with equity as a single undertaking, different from both neoliberal understanding, no, of the right, trickle down economics, but also of neo-populist understandings of the populist left. No? So growth with equity has a strong component of solidarity, which takes us to the role of the state. No? We, of course, believe in an open market in, in economy. You know, the Christian democracy movement in Europe, especially the Germans, and I share with them this concept of a social market economy. No? Now they refer to a social and ecological market economy. No? That was the de definition of Angela Merkel and the Christian Democrats in Germany uh, 10 years ago. So we are very much led to the solidarity component in terms of, of an active role of the state uh, as an agent for the common good. No? Uh, that's a very important concept in our tradition, in our political philosophy. The dignity of the human person, the common good no, beyond the market forces. So we are more than the point of convergence between supply and demand. No, there's the dignity of the human persons, there's the promotion of working classes, no? and there's and solidarity is a very, very key and strong component of our blueprint. And thank you, Ignacio. We have another question from Chris Erickson. Uh, he asks, is there no theory of class struggle found in historic Christian democracy? I follow up with, did the rejection of totalitarian socialism, Stalin, et cetera, not throw the baby socialism, economic solidarity out with the bathwater totalitarianism? You know, he's asking about, you know, non-authoritarian left populism does not seem bad to me. It's just social democracy uh, from Chris Erickson. Well, Chris, uh, what is populism? <laughs> That's a big discussion. Eh? Populism, you know, starts in the Russian literature of the late 19th century. Populism is, let's say, Andrew Jackson in the United States in the 1830s. In Latin America, eh, populism is very much demagoguery. No? Eh, populis also, populism is a sentiment. It's the appeal to a sentiment of the people, el pueblo, o povo, 
by a charismatic leader, usually, no, a charismatic leader, bypassing and um, threatening, no, the institutions of representative de representative democracy, no. So what matters in populism, which apparently is quite naive in terms of the promotion of the people, which could be the problem with that. Well, the problem with that is that usually it takes a form in terms of this appeal by a charismatic leader you know, to the masses of the people, to the public opinion against the elites, the political elites, the business elites, let's say Wall Street or, 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 the, or Washington DC or whatever, you know? uh, and in the case of Latin America, the oligarchies. But the problem with populism you know, uh, is that it preaches that there's a shortcut in the way toward development. And we believe that there's no shortcuts in the way towards development and democracy, no? Uh, so there's no uh, paradise at the turn of the corner, so to speak, no? So you have to pave a way, no? Without throwing the baby and the water and everything, no? So including the institutions, but only through the strengthening of the institutions of representative democracy. Is it possible to undertake reforms, even structural reforms, as in our case, we did the agrarian reform in the 1960s. You know? The government of President Frey was called a revolution in freedom. Revolution because it advocated structural reforms, but in freedom, with respect to democratic institutions, to the rule of law. So our experience in Latin America with populism was that whether from the right or the left, I insist, whether Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil or Nicolás Maduro in Venezuela, is that both have in common that behind this criticism of the elites, of the oligarchies, and so on, which is very legitimate, no? finally, there is the questioning of representative demo democracy and its institutions. And that's the problem. That's why I say it's a, a basic threat on democracy. No? Now, to follow up with that, Ignacio, uh, what you just described there was a targeting of the oligarchies without class struggle. And I wonder if you could unpack that a bit more, how you balance that, what you say is a legitimate um, expression of problems with corrupt regimes and the hoarding of wealth without turning that into a class struggle of us versus them and how Christian democracy has managed to do that. Well, we, we reject the concept of class struggle you know, in the Marxist uh, tradition of thought. Of course, we believe in this social classes as a category of analysis. No, we have to turn to Aristotle there, not to Marx. No, social classes exist. There are tensions between the social classes. So we have been very effective in diminishing poverty. In Chile, let me tell you, Albert, we had the fastest poverty reduction in the world in the 20 years of the Concertación, this coming together of Christian democracy and social democracy, from 40% to 10%. No? And that's not only growth, but it's also, also the public policies, an active role of the state around the question of solidarity. So you, know, you don't need to advocate class struggle no? in order to promote the working classes, the emerging middle sectors uh, of society no? uh, that are the other side of the coin. No? Uh, so um, basically, our commitment to social justice, the promotion of the working classes, historically the proletariat. Now we are going through something so different, which is the turn from the uh, industrial revolution to the digital revolution. So today we have a completely new world about the development of technologies and all that we know, which uh, uh, demand on our part, a new way of doing politics, no? uh, which is very difficult because in the era of internet and the digital revolution and the tweets you know, and the social networks, uh, it's very difficult to govern today in any country in the world, you know, very difficult. So we don't need to advocate. We have never done so class struggle in order to struggle against oligarchic rule, you know, the, the excesses of liberal capitalism or neoliberalism today, which is one of our enemies. Huh? Uh, as well as, as neo-populism. No, but we have to advocate something different, not necessarily kind of third way, but yes, something that the search for the social justice does not end up uh, with the erosion, no, or the weakening of the institutions of representative democracy. 
Now, Ignacio, I want to circle back to kind of the question that you pose uh, to us, and I, I want to throw it back at you just a little bit. Yes. Because of your experience at, at Notre Dame as, as a professor, as a foreign minister, who, of course, 2004 to 2006, when the United States was engaged in the war on terror, when the President Bush had to engage with the United States as extensive time living and studying and teaching in the United States. What is your viewpoint of why there has not yet emerged, and hopefully we will do it, Right. Uh, but why has not yet emerged a, a strong uh, Christian democratic tradition or party within the United States of America? Well, I wish I had an answer. Uh, Albert, I was expecting that you could give us give us some uh, some uh, clues about that. But my interpretation, correct me if I'm wrong, having lived not only four years in the United States, but with a long relationship, I studied in a, in a school of Holy Cross congregation here in Chile, St. George's College for many years in, in my formative years. So this is long standing relationship with the United States. But my impression, Albert, is that in the US religion, although we have said that Christian democracy is not a religious movement, no, but it's Christian democracy in the end, no? It's rather a private matter, no? In the United States. So it's very difficult, I would say, I would propose uh, to have a kind of uh, political platform in the public space with the name of Christian, no? something similar could be in Mexico, by the way, huh? uh, which has this strong anti-clerical secular uh, tradition. So perhaps uh, one of the reasons is a cultural one, no? uh, in terms of this understanding of a Christian democratic movement, no? that as I, as, as I say, it's a non-confessional, lay, secular understanding. No? Uh, I'm a Catholic, I'm a Christian Democrat, but you don't have to be a religious advocate in order to uh, take part of a political, of a Christian democratic uh, political movement. What do you think? Am I so wrong? Well, you know, I, I do have thoughts and I, I'll share them with you. One of my thoughts is that the United States largely didn't need Christian democracy because of its success. I mean, if we think about where Christian democracy has really taken hold, it's when people have gone either to the far right or the far left and you've seen it fail. And then it creates an opening for Christian Democrats to say, you know, guys, there's a third way where we don't have to engage in a populist nationalist struggle against foreigners or internal aliens or whoever the enemy is. You don't have to engage in the class struggle. There's a new way of thinking about humanity. And you've seen where that has worked in the United States in, say, the abolitionist movement, in the civil rights movement which were very often explicitly Christian in their rhetoric and knowledge, even much of the rhetoric of President Roosevelt during the Second World War against Nazi Germany made use of Christian imagery and alliteration. But on the whole, as a country that has essentially conquered a continent throughout the 19th century, industrialized, overtook Britain and Germany, overtook China in 1894 as the world's largest economy, won both of the, the great wars, the First World War and the Second World War, uh, was able to win the Cold War, that that success rate in the United States, I think has almost been an, an interrupter. It's made us almost overconfident in doing things the old way. Uh, the United States tends to have an island mentality in terms of looking at solutions. I mean, you see this in the way we look at transit. We have transit problems in the United States. We do not look at the new developments that are taking place in Europe. It's as if it takes place outside the United States, as Americans, we don't have to learn from it. So I think part of it's, we have a position of strength and power, even with all the internal problems that we have, that gives us an overconfidence and a hesitancy to consider whether or not outside traditions, members of majority, historical majority Protestant nation, you know, the outside uh, traditions, rather from Europe or for Latin America, might actually be useful to us. And that therefore we, to an extent, haven't needed, but also haven't been open to it because it would mean reassessing ourselves with an outsider's lens. I, I see. I agree. You have a point, a strong point there, of course. Uh, let me see if there's any more questions because um, they're coming through very quickly. And I apologize to anyone if I do not get to your question this evening. We have about eight minutes left. Uh, let's see. There is uh, one from Cameron uh, Wolks. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, it says, you bring up nationalist movements as a growing threat in the West. What role do you believe Christian democracy has to counter the far right? Do you believe there is a middle ground that can appeal to conservative populist concerns without becoming a sort of demagoguery? I think you've touched on this a, a bit, but let's make it more about the United States. Uh, what do you think 
Christian democracy could offer to the United States in some of its populist right concerns? Yes, well, I think, uh, Albert, that historically, in the last century, nationalism and populism have been the major threats on democracy. No, uh, look at the period between the two wars, for example. No, uh, in Europe uh, and so on. So that's so. This is not very new. No, uh, in the world. No, of course. Afterwards, it became communism uh, in the Cold War uh, period. So you know, the Western world won that war uh, apparently, and not only apparently. The 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 coming down of the Berlin Wall in 1989 and of authoritarian socialism of the former Soviet Union, Eastern Europe and so on, was, was very important for us in terms of the uh, triumph of our ideas you know, on human rights, on democracy, uh, on social justice uh, and so on. But then in the 90s, there came this kind of euphoria you know, of triumphalism in the Western world around, let's say, democracy and capitalism. No, which even led Francis Fukuyama, you know, to announce the kind of the end of the war, of history. No, we know what he meant about that, the Hegelian paradigm and so on. But there was a kind of triumphalism, which was very pernicious. No, at that time, let me say, we were also critical of the kind of economic policies, or let's say Margaret Thatcher uh, in United Kingdom or Ronald Reagan, Reagan in, in the United States around this kind of trickle down economics. I don't want to make a caricature of it. And the Chicago boys in Chile, as I told you uh, before. So we were very critical of that kind of approach to public policies uh, with this kind of negative view on the role of the state. Uh, we are not statists, but we believe that the state has a role to play as an agent for the common good in the realm of public policies. No? Remember that Margaret Thatcher said that society did not exist. No, uh, and uh, President Reagan said, you know, the state is the problem, <laughs> not the solution. So we have to look for this kind of middle ground as the question uh, focuses. No, we don't have to choose between extremes. Christian democracy has always been about the middle ground. No, different from leftist, rightist, neoliberal, uh, neo-populist, uh, extreme positions. Uh, uh, and I think there's a, a very important role to play in the United States. You have seen the widening of the gap in terms of socioeconomic uh, levels you know, in the last 30 years. If you look at the figures, it's very impressive. The question of racial violence, you know, we saw last year uh, what an important issue it is. The question of migrations, uh, you know, there are all kinds of issues you know, that can be dealt with from this middle ground uh, perspective that perhaps may create something similar to the Christian democratic uh, movement. Yeah? But that's uh, some of the ideas I would like to, to share. Ignacio, thank you again. A final question for you. Uh, this is from Kyle uh, Isseri. Apologies again if I've mispronounced your last name. Uh, Kyle asks, for those of us who are new to Christian democracy from backgrounds in the US left or right, who should we read for an introduction to these ideas? Other than yourself, of course, Ignacio. Well, no, no. well, I wrote a book, which is the future of Christian democracy, like 20 years ago. It's in Spanish, I'm afraid. But there's another book that I wrote, Democracy in Latin America, if we want to uh, have that kind of, and the tensions between democracy and populism, no? that was published by Notre Dame Press in 2013. But I would start from the classics. I mean, let us look at Jacques Maritain, and his book of 1943, Christianity and Democracy, you know, which paved the way philosophically you know, about this coming together of the Christian tradition and the democratic tradition that had evolved in very contradictory ways ever since the French Revolution. So there's a lot of, uh, of literature. The French pol political philosophers, uh, Jacques Maritain, Emmanuel Mounier, look at the documents of the Vatican Council, uh, the encyclicas of 1962 and 1965, which are very impressive you know, about this opening from the Catholic Church. This is also about Protestantism you know, in Europe, clearly. You know. In South America, we are, not, we are largely Catholic, as you know, although uh, evangelicals and prote Protestantism has become very important and we have a strong dialogue uh, there. 
So I would point to Jacques Maritain, 1943, Christianity and Democracy, to, be, to begin with. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ignacio, for your time this evening, for, again, a very stimulating, thought-provoking conversation. I want to turn it over to Amar now, uh, who will take us to our next session. But I, I think I speak for everyone, Ignacio, where we hope to stay in contact and to continue Absolutely. to engage and to have you back because you have given us so much to think about and to work with uh, from your experience as someone who has actually put Christian democracy into practice, the highest levels of government, and in pursuing a, a foreign policy of engagement uh, with the world rather than turning away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Albert.